welcome to you, Gwen. Just for to introduce Gwen, you are an artist engineer working across disciplines based in Northern Ireland and working with public health, I think, and community. So very interdisciplinary. So it's fantastic okay. to have you here with us. All right, thanks, Anna. Okay, so I'll just share my screen. And um, hopefully everybody, can everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, as Anna said, my name is Gwen Stevenson and I'm speaking this morning from a very controversial area called Ochnacloy, which is literally on the border of Northern and Southern Ireland. So we're in the um, we're we're in the vortex here at the moment. So today I'm going to speak to you about a project I've been a particular project I've been involved in called the Heart of Living and Dying, which is a public health agency initiated project to speak about advanced care planning. Um, as Anna said, I'm a practicing visual artist and I work across disciplines across arts, technology, and social sciences. And my aim is to create art that has a long-term um, transformative effect and always trying to contribute towards positive change for a fair and more sustainable world. So I've more than 20 years experience in community and outreach based um, socially engaged projects across Northern Ireland. So that would involve um, art and health projects, peace building projects, community um, projects in disadvantaged and areas. Um, and I'm commissioned by the Public Health Agency, the NHS, local um, healthcare trusts, local councils, and various arts organisations that work here in Northern Ireland. But really, my aim in all my artwork is to engage people in such a way that it has a positive impact upon their own individual health, but also the health of their communities. Um, and, and always looking towards trying to um, improve relations between communities here in Northern Ireland. So the heart of living and dying is a, a work that I worked with through the um, trust areas and the public, um, the health agency. It's a two hour group process. And the idea is, is to get people talking about advanced care planning. Um, it was initiated back in 2017. It was a pilot project to mark Dying Matters Awareness Week. And it was initiated by a senior social worker called Deirdre McKenna, who worked in the Southern Health and Social Care Trust, which is the area within which I live, and also the hospice services. So I had been working with the trust area and also the hospice services. And this was a, a project that was funded by both those organisations, along with the public, public health agency. And the idea was to try and give the general public the opportunity to gauge in advanced care planning conversation. So four years later, we're still running the events. I think we've had more than 40 events at this stage. And the idea is, is that we would rent um, maybe a cafe or a hotel room or somewhere that's really comfortable and advertise across social media and in churches or you know public um, periodicals or newspapers and just invite people from the public to come in and have a conversation about end of life and also about what matters to them in their own life. So the concept was actually taken from the, the idea of the death cafe, cafe um, concept which had run on the continent over previous years but we thought that was too hardcore really for us here in Northern Ireland so we wanted to take a more gentle approach um, where people would come to a safe space and talk about what matters to them in their lying, in their living and ultimately then how that applies to their dying. And the idea is that it would encourage the participants not just to talk to the people in the session that morning, but to talk to their loved ones um, when they went home. Uh, and at a time when they were healthy and well and maybe young and hadn't thought about end of life, rather than at a period of time where they, you know, they had got a diagnosis of a terminal illness or a serious illness, and there was a crisis in the family. So the whole dr drive behind this was to think of dying as a natural part of living. So in the same way as you prepare for a baby arriving or the birth of a new baby, that people would also think of their end of life in a natural way that wasn't um, 
initiated by a crisis or uh, an accident or a serious illness or something. So my role in this um, as an artist is coming from the idea that um, we recognize that art has an important role in, tra in transforming um, our capacity to cope with bereavement and also to open up a public, um, a healthy public conversation about death. So this is recognized by the Westminster Report of 2007 that um, the use of art really has an important role in transforming capacities of individuals to cope and also within communities. And really that is the tenant of my work over the last um, decades is, is to use art where people find it difficult to talk, but they may be able to express themselves through their creativity, through shared um, art making. Um, and it opens up a different type of dialogue, which is safe. So um, the idea of using this in the heart of living and dying was to make a conversation which is difficult, more accessible through the use of art. So my role is to um, attend the event, not as a participant, but as a, what Deirdre would call a quiet witness. So at the outset, people would realize that I am I'm not there to talk, to join the conversation or to comment or to in any way um, participate, but rather just to sit back and to listen and try and get a sense of what's being said or to notice the mood or the emotions of the participants. And then what I would do is take that away after the event and spend a couple of weeks mulling over what I heard and try and respond to that in some way through a piece of visual art or a poem. Um, now, the, the, the aim of this is to add to the session by allowing people to have a keepsake. So if, say, for example, you go to the session, you go home and then you get back to normal living and all the different um, priorities that you have. In a couple of weeks time, then something arrives in the post and it reminds you that you had that conversation. So if you had put that conversation to the back of your mind, it brings it forward and hopefully a loved one in your family would say to you, oh, what's that? And you would talk to them about, well, this came from a conversation I had a couple of weeks ago about end of life. And, and hopefully then people say, oh, that's really scary. And, you know, and they say, oh, no, no, it was a very easy conversation to have. And it would open up the conversation, hopefully. And then people would talk about what actually matters to them in their living and ultimately in their dying. And it becomes very, very normal. Um, so say, for example, somebody it's important for somebody to have people around them in their living if they're very sociable. Maybe they want to tell their loved ones that it's important to them that there's people around them when they're dying. Or equally, if the opposite of people like quietness, maybe that's what they would want in their dying as well. So the momentous that I've, I've created, um, as I said, there's been over 40 events, so there's been lots of different types of mementos, but I'm just going to give you a sample this morning of some of the things I've produced. Each one is individually and uniquely made, and that reflects the fact that each person is individual and each person wishes around their end of life is going to be different. And it's important that they're, they're, it's a tangible piece um, that's posted out to individuals so that they have something that they can hold. And it's almost like that they're holding the space or holding the peace around having this conversation. And what I try to do as well is have a text piece that explains the concept and references the event. So sometimes the concept I come up with mightn't be totally obvious to people who have participated. But I, I, I try, to, try to explain it through a piece of text. And also, obviously, through the last couple of years, we haven't been able to meet um, physically. Um, up to pre-COVID, we were able to set up like safe spaces where we had, you know, round tables with tablecloths and flowers and sweets and everything that made the place comfortable. So we've had to try and adapt that to COVID. And we've had online sessions, which has been challenging, but it's still working. And we're doing our best to adapt to that. So just to give you a flavor of some of the stuff that I've produced, this is the latest one, but our latest one was in September 2021. And as you can see, it's a felt piece. Um, and this came about because in the course of the conversation, people were saying it's an ill wind that blows no good. And we couldn't, people couldn't remember what was that, that was what was that about? And 
eventually anyway, I'll just read what I said here. We talked about our lives in the winds of change and what matters most to us. We talked about our happiest memories, stupid laughs with friends, simple pleasures of walking dogs, being outdoors, swimming, playing, fruit picking, tending our animals, running about after children, holidays, all carefree times when we had freedom from responsibility. Will we ever live like that again without direction or any specific goals? What would it be like to ride the wind, like a tidy dandelion seed without wings holding the hope from afar within? When anxiety, stress and the many pressures of life bear down on us, leaving us feeling suffocated, could we stop to catch a breath? As we breathe, could we sense that the same air that carries the dandelion seeds fills our lungs and gives us life? So this was my response. It was a unique handcrafted art felt piece using the ancient technique of felting. And as you can see, each piece is individually made. So the idea of that was to reference the dandelion seed and in these COVID times, the sense of breath and how important breath and breathing is. Um, and that was part of our discussion in that. So obviously I'm not capturing the whole essence, the whole sense of conversation or recording the conversation, but what I'm doing is capturing an essence of what has been said or looking for a creative idea to try and respond. So just a couple of examples here. This was another one, this was from December, 2020. And um, it, was a, it was our first actual virtual Heart of Living and Dying, our first online piece. And I talked about the unfolding journey. We talked about how life seems to unfold through us in a way that does not always fit our plans. We talked about our happiest memories and how they influence our present day experience. We want security and comfort, but know that everything changes. We trust that life is an unfolding journey and risk conversations about our own mortality. So again, this was in the context of COVID where we were very unsure of where life was taking us or our own journeys, or our own plans for our journeys had changed. So the idea of this art piece was to depict the, the life cycle of the thistle. And I had taken pictures that summer of the thistle over the course of the summer and um, you know, I look for the symbolism, the flower symbolism of the thistle, which is an enlightened person, a person who has gained their crown. And equally then within that, it, there's, there's the idea of the thorn symbolism, a life that has adversity and has faced challenge. So that's a fold out book. People would get it and they'd be able to 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 touch it and, and unfold it and, and, and it, it unfolds into this kind of sculptural piece, but then flattens out. So the idea is that people would Take, get the art piece and that they would enjoy it. Just some other examples. This was actually back in March 2020 and um, we called it Take Heart. So again, it's a felting piece, but the idea was to capture the essence of the conversations with it, which at that time captured on the, um, centered on the importance and influence of our relationships, past and present. So the heart being the symbol, obviously, of relationships and love. And again, in COVID times, this um, tried to capture the essence of what was important when for the first time that we were separated from our loved ones and and that connection wasn't as, as automatic as we had always assumed. So again, each piece is different. Um, this was actually expanded into to, to, um, not just people who participated in the heart of living and dying, but um, I made hearts for people who at that time it was it was the first time that people couldn't be with their loved ones in their passing so what we did was created hearts for um, bereaved people and also a heart for their loved ones so that they when they weren't able to go to the funeral or they weren't able to be with them during their passing that they were able to put a heart with them in you know with with the the deceased person so there was that connection there, and that was quite powerful. Um, and that was with the palliative care team. So it was a response to COVID, and it was a way of allowing people to have a connection, a tangible connection with the person, even though they weren't allowed, obviously, to be with them or um, to go through the normal grieving um, processes that people go through. Um, and just an example of it's a photography project that. Um, a lot of my work is based on ecological and environmental themes. So this was a, a piece that was 
came from a May 9, 2019 event, and it was called Permanent Nest. So the idea was that I captured images of a swarm of bees resting on a tree branch. And the sight of the swarm of bees kind of nerves some people. However, it's very natural and a wonderful part of the life cycle of the honeybee. So um, bees are typically docile and non-threatening when they are swarming. Likewise, the topic of death and dying can fill people with dread, but equally it is part of our life cycle. Similarly, when we feel safe to talk about the subject, conversation flows. We talked about various euphemisms for death, pathing, demise, drawing our last breath, leaving this world, permanent rest. As worker bees will scout to find their permanent nest during their life cycle, our time will come to die as a natural part of our life. Um, we talked about what is important to us in our living and our dying. We talked about making that known to our community of loved ones so that when our time comes to die, like the industrious bees, we have made preparations. Our hope is that in doing so, our communities will benefit and be held together in the sure knowledge that they are, they are carrying out our wishes. Um, this was a, a painting. I'm just showing a range of different um, mediums that um, I've used in the course of the last four years. So these are, again, individual paintings that were sent out to people. and. Um, in this, we said, follow your heart, it knows the way. It was November 2017, and the trees had lost their leaves, and we were looking towards winter um, and trying to be positive about it. Um, interesting that it's November now again, and we're at that stage. Um, here's another example of a painting, and this was simply called Alone Time. And one of the things that came out of that particular event was we talked about longing to take time on our own away from the businesses or business, busyness of everyday life to reflect and consider what is important to us. This artwork evokes that longing. We hope you enjoy it. So again, people, one of the things that came up in that conversation was that yes, people recognized it was important to plan for their demise, but sometimes it was hard to take time out to do that, that other things took priority. Um, so I suppose that's what, what this art piece was trying to invoke, that longing for time to reflect and time to be alone. And this was a simple um, painting as well. The idea was, I think it was around cherry blossom season, which is around April. And cherry blossoms are small, delicate pink flowers produced by cherry blossom trees. And they're a timeless metaphor for human existence. Uh, blooming season is powerful, glorious and intoxicating, but remarkably brief. After only two weeks, the blooms drop to the ground and wither, a visual reminder that our lives too are precious and fleeting. As Japan's national flower, the cherry blossom is revered for its overwhelming beauty and its enduring expression of life, death and renewal. So. Um, Sorry, I think I've stopped sharing there, have I? Okay, it's working. Am I still sharing? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, can you see feedback slide there? Yeah. Um, so some of the feedback that we've got from people are that um, people are delighted about receiving this um, memento in the post, that they've reflected that conversations about death and dying are often heartfelt. And as art is a language of the heart, it is wonderful to have that creative expression as a key element of the project and is now embedded in the workshop process. And here's some more feedback here. Um, the value of such a beautifully facilitated event cannot be overstated. The follow-up memento serves as a gentle reminder to make my wishes known and a genuine appreciation for my participation. Thank you. Um, a very difficult subject that you want to put off, given our culture here in Northern Ireland, where we don't talk about stuff, um, whatever you say, say nothing, all that kind of thing. So it's that it's very important to have those conversations. It's important that the next of kin know what you want. Um, so, you know, the feedback has been good. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing the slides now. 
if I can. And now I wanted to show you a film which we've created. It's about 10 minutes long, Anna, so if I've gone over time, you can stop me. I see now. Okay, now I'm back. Um, so I'm just going to play this film, which will give you a sense of it. Gwen, if we can show five minutes of it, yeah. is that okay? Because actually... you've got the controls. Oh, have I? Okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'll come back in after five and stop sharing. Here at the foot of the mountains of Morn, we've come from the comfort of our homes to this cosy hotel, and it's beautiful. Just the drive here this morning would soothe the soul, all sunny, alive and full of spring, We rabbits hopping on the green, and isn't life a precious thing when you think about it all? And I guess that's why we're here today, to stop and think to have our say on why life matters, all the ways we share these precious moments. Enjoy the cool breeze on a sunny day, the journey, the lessons along the way. We all want to make the most of it. We all want to enjoy our time here, that bit of sun. But we're not just here to talk about life, not just here to talk about the easy, fun stuff, not just here to have a wee scone, although the scones help us along. We're here to talk about what happens when we come to the end of life. What happens when we need to have those uncomfortable conversations. It can be difficult, painful even. But when we gather together, when we share and all these mixed emotions come to the surface, we begin to speak the language of the heart. We may not move mountains, we may not find all the answers, but once we've broken through the silence, once we've been given permission to talk about those things we don't often talk about, it's a good start along this path we all must walk. A good wee bit of support to help prepare us and our loved ones for the future. We hear ourselves in a different form. We talk about how we'd like to go on living how we might want to change, how we might want to rearrange things. We share all the things that matter most to us. Peace of mind, our quality of life, loving and being loved, our family, their safety, health and well-being. We talk about how we'd like to live our lives and how we might prepare for when we die. Strange to hear ourselves say these things out loud. Strange but good. Maybe initially we didn't want to go there, but now somehow it feels comfortable. It's amazing, empowering. We feel more relaxed when we share these things and realise we share so many of the same wishes, hopes and dreams. Sometimes you haven't thought about these things until somebody asks you. Sometimes it feels too taboo. Sometimes you're just too busy, just too on top of things to go under the surface. But today, we took that risk, spoke from the heart, shared our emotions, made connections, shared the privilege of witnessing real, true storytelling and special moments. Some tears, but also laughter, shared together and I hope we can all travel home feeling better for it, gracious and thankful.
The bluest of skies above us today, the slightest breeze on the trees outside, and what a curious thing to spy for this audience of green, as I imagine what the trees might hear if they were listening in, behind these quiet windows an extraordinary conversation. Yes, human beings often stop over a cuppa, over a pot of tea, talk about the weather, stop and say, how are you? But how often do we stop to talk about that thing? That thing most of us would rather not talk about. The trees have got it down. They seem to be at ease with the process of living and dying. So many of us fret and fight it. But there are important things to be said. Important questions, when shared, become less difficult to answer. Before we know it, the conversation is flowing. And that dread we once felt melts in bursts of laughter and shared understanding. Much like the leaves of trees, we are every one unique, each to go in our own time and see those we have loved in time go too, some sudden, some slow, but most too soon. Painful, inspiring, here we are, complete strangers sharing from the heart of experience hopes and fears opening doors to share in time with family and enjoy the years together. Yes, I guess it might be nice to be a tree, maybe in my next life, but for now I'll make the most of this, this time and place the bliss of a bit of sun and one more cup of tea and I'll think of those that matter most to me and what I'd like to be remembered for. Love passion, faith, integrity, courage, all of which I have witnessed here today. Walking through life we gather thoughts like stones in our pockets. In city, in the forest, on the road that brought us here today. We all carry life's moments, lessons learned, memories, connections, questions answered and unanswered. We turn them over behind our eyes. Each precious part of each person's life is held somehow, whether in a pocket, a heart or a mind. We tend to keep these things inside. Sometimes we share, sometimes confide in friends. But when is the time to really talk from the heart? It's not every day we talk about this. It's not every day we let ourselves take those stones out of our pockets, let alone share them. Some things feel too heavy to say over a cuppa. Imagine if next time someone said, Oh, Kaya, how are you? You replied, Well, Mabel, I've been thinking about death. And yet, here we are today. As this rare bit of sun lights our way, we realise the value of this space to share. All of us gathered from different corners to share what it is that matters to us. We start by sharing fears, apprehensions, recollections of stories and things our parents said, times our lives have been touched by death. And surprisingly, it's not all bad. We smile as we talk. This is far from a sad discussion. We even have a laugh. This talking from the heart feels good. It feels real. Maybe we should do this more often. Amazing how heartening it can be when we realise we're all just human beings and we all carry these hopes and fears and dreams, wishes of how we'd like to be remembered, concern about loved ones, family, carers and friends all those we share a connection with. A risk, yes, to talk from the heart, among strangers no less, but a cup is a start and a biscuit. And once you open up a bit, it can be miraculous, even poetic, to pause, sit back and reflect on what is really important.
Okay, Anna. Gwen, thank you so much. I've seen the whole film, so uh, and you can catch it, can't you, on YouTube? Yes, so it I'm is, sorry yeah. to have cut you off. It is very, very beautiful, as is all of this work, Gwen. It's it's deeply moving. Uh, okay. So thank you so much for for sharing it with us. I think we're going to move on, as you both suggested. So if those who are listening, hold questions. Uh, we're going to have time for questions at the end of the three presentations at the end of the morning. So please hold on to questions for Gwen. So thank you again, Gwen. Fantastic. And Margaret, is it Margaret or, or, or Maggie? Which do you prefer to be called? It, it doesn't matter, Anna. So whichever you feel most comfortable with. <laughs> Fine. I'm going to hand on to you then, Maggie. You're the director of the Centre for Art and Dying at St Mary's University, and you're also a trustee of St Joseph's, uh, a, a, very, a very wonderful hospice, St Joseph's Hospital in the East End of London. And um, I'm just going to hand straight on to you um, now. And so we, we're kind of thanks to Gwen. We're more or less back on time. But what I think I'll do is We'll, um, you go till half past 10, but if you start to come go as if you're looking as though you might go over, I'm just going to do that for five minutes before we are due to end. Is that okay? As a gentle <laughs> reminder. <laughs> okay, thank you. Welcome, Maggie. And, um, and thank you. Thank you, Anna and, and Gwen. Thank you for that incredibly moving presentation. It really was quite something, as you said, Anna. It, it, it sort of uh, moved me very much so. I'm just going to try and uh, get my presentation up. Um, let's see. Uh, ah, wonderful. OK. So just as, as Gwen was talking about uh, being gentle and uh, about what you might want um, in those last days, um, maybe you want to be with people because you always love to be around people, maybe you just want a few around you. Um, the Centre for the Art of Dying Well uh, felt there was a space, a need to uh, create a deathbed etiquette. Um, before I move on, can everybody see the etiquette? Can everybody see the, the slides? I, I presume everybody can see the I slides. I can, so I think that means they um, can. Okay, brilliant. Um, so we decided to create a, an etiquette. Um, an etiquette um, in 2009, so before COVID, um, and then obviously we, we felt there was a need to reconfigure it for COVID. And I suppose what um, I might hope that you would take from today is that this may be helpful for you in all of your areas of work um, about how to be by the bedside, um, both in normal times, if you can describe it as normal times, and, and during times of uh, a pandemic. And why the needs, uh, well, just as Gwen and the film um, highlighted, we know that death and dying uh, is very often seen as a taboo, uh, particularly in the UK, with people avoiding the subject for fear of upsetting others. And um, increasingly more and more deaths are taking place in, in hospital and less at home, and people have less experience of being by the bedside of a dying loved one. And as a result, there can be a lot of uncertainty about what to expect when at the bedside of a loved one who is dying. So the, the etiquette, uh, both for COVID and, and non-COVID times, was created uh, by The Art of Dying Well uh, in collaboration uh, with palliative care physicians and lecturers at Lancaster University Medical School and also uh, a wonderful palliative care consultant at St Oswald's Hospice in Newcastle. Um, back in the 15th century, when, when death was very much at the doorstep, uh, there was a text called the Ars Moriendi, which offered spiritual and, and practical advice to those approaching death and to their family and friends. And it actually had, um, what well, they've called it protocols and procedures, which really isn't a language that we'd use 
day. But uh, but really there was a sense of how to be at the bedside as well. And so we felt there was a need to, to update this uh, for uh, and really that it be a gentle advice and accompaniment for the final stages of life. And why did we choose the um, the images that w that we chose? Um, well, it's really because um, I suppose that when you use cartoon figures, that in a way it it can appeal to a, a broader reach of of of, of people. Uh, we're actually doing some focus groups at the moment and one to one interviews and. And that some feel uncomfortable with these images, others like them, and um, rightly so. A number of doctors have said that you wouldn't necessarily have a drip um, when somebody was dying. Um, but people liked that it was in the hospital setting because, um, well, a number of people do die in the hospital setting. Um, I'm going to look at a, a number of these different. Um, uh, sort of guides that we put together for the etiquette and um, the first one uh, be prepared for a change in breathing patterns um, it's normal for your loved one to stop breathing and then start and this may sound like a gasp it indicates the terminal phase of their illness I was um, particularly struck um, when uh, my mother was was dying in a in a hospital um, that um, many people when they arrive at the hospital and they hear that news and really you can't take in that news uh, and it's all going over your head when the the um, consultant is speaking that when when you're faced with the situation of being by the bedside um, that you don't understand what's happening it's a completely disorientating and frightening place to be um, and so I really sense that there was a need for this to come out more and and hence uh, the the fact that it was a co-collaboration with, with medical experts as well because when my mother was dying uh, towards the very end a, a nurse felt that um, my mother uh, was agitated because it was the the breathing sounded labored it was the gurgling sound it was the natural process of dying and uh, my mother had a had a very good peaceful death and um, I explained to the nurse that this was a natural a normal part of the dying process and it was a new thing to her um, the some of you may be familiar with this that the the dying person may speak about dead relatives coming to meet them, listen and, and don't be afraid. Um, during, uh, as a trustee at St. Joseph's Hospice and, and in my work for the Art of Dying Well and, and really about being in, embedded in my community in, in Kent, um, increasingly I hear more stories of um, people having a sense that there is or having had a sense that there was uh, somebody in the room when their loved one was dying. A non-threatening, loving presence. One of the, the nurses at um, St. Joseph's Hospice uh, told me a story of a woman who she was caring for um, at St. Joseph's and uh, she was just popping in to say goodnight to, uh, to this lady. And um, she said, I'll, I'll see you in the morning. And she said, um, no, no, you won't see me in the morning. Um, my mother came to visit me last night, her, her dead mother. And um, I, I, I don't think I'll be here tomorrow. And um, when this nurse came back to the room the, the following day, uh, she had died during the night of a cardiac arrest. And, and there are there are just increasingly more and more stories about how a dying person is is met by somebody that they they love the don't be surprised if your loved one dies when you're out of the room it it happens a lot um this um i wrote an article for the times about the the etiquette and uh, this particular element of the article 
um, led to, um, I, I received a number of beautiful letters as a result, and it made the the um, the pain of writing the article um, very worthwhile because uh, there was one lady who, who wrote that it had been four years uh, since the death of her husband, um, and she had never been reconciled to the fact because she had, um, well, she was very tired and she'd just gone home to have a little sleep. He was dying in a hospice and um, he had died when um, when she was just having that sleep. And uh, she said it was only after having read the article and having seen that this is actually quite normal that she, she felt um, more at peace. The other is reassure your loved one that they are free to let go. This permission is often taken. Um, going back to, to Gwen's point about opening up the conversation about death and dying and the importance of Dying Matters Week, that it's it's interesting and, and positive that the, the etiquette uh, received a lot of, of coverage um, you'll see there where it received coverage and uh, important because it opens up the discussion about death and dying so that we can all start preparing now and preparing as as Gwen so so beautifully said to to live life now to to go out and walk the dog to be in nature to to have those those fun time to fun times together I, in part how we we managed to get the interest is that we commissioned a poll uh, and the poll uh, highlighted that uh, surprisingly uh, one in two people felt prepared for death uh, surprisingly and positively surprisingly and that it was roughly 40 percent of people felt unprepared. We'd also um, put a package of audio together, um, which is um, carers, uh, palliative care nurses um, and consultants talking together about um, how to be by the bedside. To Bretts, uh, which, um, as you probably know, is the authority on business and cultural etiquette, said that the, the guide was a lovely, useful and reassuring resource. And um, this really struck a chord with me because a wonderful man who is a hospice poet, um, he uh, wrote a poem uh, as a result of um, reading uh, the, the etiquette. Um, I am dying perhaps today. Listen well in this way of love. Learn, remember, it's about me. If you're concerned, do get help with whatever you may see. Take a break, keep your strength, protect the space you form around. Search for memories, music plays, find the peace in beautiful sounds. Be sure to connect family, friends, gadgets, social, news, press send. Bring the children, let them choose. To see it's natural, share the end. I'll need to sleep quite a lot. And my ramblings may surprise. Have no fear, it's quite okay. Mystery's part of being wise. Important words, perhaps our last. I'm sorry, thank you, I love you, or sit with me, just hold my hand. There is much more in silence, true. I might may die when you're away. Please don't threat, it's quite okay. Time is time, death is death. It may be meant to be this way, like the way my breath will falter, my throat to make odd sounds. Be reassured, this is the way. The ending comes around. Now be brave and say goodbye. When it seems my time has come, you must accept I'm dying now. I'm free to go. You carry on. Just to give you an idea of the, the importance of digital in all of our areas of work, um, the, 
the guide, um, the main guide has been viewed by uh, nearly 10,000 visitors. We, uh, we've put together both a, 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 an Islamic, a Catholic and a Jewish deathbed etiquette and you can see the, the figures there. And with, within all of those um, faith guides, there was a sense of being reconciled with others and being reconciled with God. So I mentioned that there was the etiquette written pre-COVID and it's there for, for you to use. It's, it's there available online. Just type in deathbed etiquette. Um, and we've also created a, a deathbed etiquette card. Um, and then we reconfigured it for COVID-19. And um, whereas the uh, non-COVID etiquette really was about how to be by the bedsides, for COVID-19 in those early days, it was about when you can't be beside the bedside. And we know the, the communicating virtually may be an option that um, it was harrowing for people as well in the focus groups that we've had for both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19. Nurses and, and, and doctors have said that uh, although it helped, it was incredibly painful for people and they would never want to see that becoming the norm because there is a sense uh, that people do need to be around their loves, loved ones if they can possibly be. Also, uh, people were um, uh, drawn to the fact of not letting feelings of guilt take over. Um, and that's uh, very, very important, accept your feelings. And, and let them pass and also take care of yourself. It's important that you keep well. Again, uh, it got a lot of um, mainstream coverage, uh, which um, we hope uh, help people um, in those uh, incredibly difficult early days. And um, during the pandemic itself, um, following on from the etiquette and, and, and how to be uh, when you can be by the bedside and how to be when, when you can't be the bed by the bedside, we had an online round table uh, with Dr. Catherine Mannix, uh, the author of, of Listen and the author of With the End in Mind, with uh, Baroness Laura Finley, who is a palliative care physician, with Dr. Lynn Bassett, who um, has been a chaplain for many years, and with a wonderful death doula, Gazala Makda. And uh, within it, um, the, 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 the people that attended were mainly nurses and um, doctors and carers and doulas, and those who, were, who um, spent a lot of their time beside uh, carers and, and people who were dying. And, and what came out really of the round table was um, of the incredible importance of being, of, of being with your loved one and uh, really to pre preparing to be by your loved one, that the importance of, of presence and, and nearness and, uh, and, and for some uh, that was only possibly possible virtually during the pandemic but it will have made a difference to the life of the loved one. And finally, uh, just a really a shout out to, to the team, uh, because it's never done alone. And there's been a, a wonderful team behind uh, the etiquette. And it's been wonderful to work with, with colleagues at Lancaster University Medical School and also um, at St Oswald's Hospice. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Maggie. Fantastic. Your work is is really important. I'm I'm really encouraged to hear um, the statistics about more people now being willing. And I'm sure that the work that you've done and the work of many others is 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 really important to that. Um, we'll hold on our questions for Maggie. So again, everybody, just keep the questions in mind. And I'm really delighted to see that Heber, who I know has been having real um, some troubles coming in from Egypt is now with us. So Heba, are you hearing us? Is all working fine? You just need to... Yes, I can hear you very well. 
Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Delighted to see you. So Delighted to see you. Now, Heba comes. She's the Associate Professor of Linguistics in Cairo, and she's currently working on an archaeological history of, of the sacred Mecca, or Maka. Um, and you're here to talk to us today about death and dying in the Islamic context. So Heba, what we've done is everybody has just spoken and then we're <laughs> gathering questions for everyone towards the end. Okay. So is that okay with you? And what I'll do, it's 10.20 now. You'll have about 20, 25 minutes and five minutes before the end, I'll do that. <laughs> and okay. then we'll bring it to a close and have about 15 minutes to ask questions and talk talk with you okay is that okay okay, okay yes. over to you Heber I'll might I'll um I will hear you but um so if you have any problems just speak and I'll I'll be there okay over to okay. you okay thank you I'm just opening the uh, my presentation and uh, I'll be right back with you okay um good morning uh, good afternoon everyone uh, glad to see you and glad to be with here with you. Uh, my title of my presentation is, can you see the presentation or um, I need to share the... Um, you need to share the, the screen, we can't see it yet. Good morning. Dear professors, doctors, ladies and gentlemen, the title of my presentation is Parallel Lives, Life Beyond the Barrier and Islamic Scientific Perspective of Death, Eternal Life and Dreams. The presentation discusses some Islamic death concepts in relation to modern science or so the fact that the dead person can hear and see. In Islamic tradition, the dead person leads a life beyond the barrier, which is unfolded in dreams and near-death experiences or NDEs. The relationships with the dead continue in the form of dreams, hence a selection of personal and historical dreams from traditional books of dreams is given. Death concepts in Islam, first in Quranic verses. In the Holy Quran, we have a description of an immediate life after death. For example, the situation of the Pharaoh of Moses and his people. We are told that they are exposed to the fire morning and evening, and when the day of the hour appears, they will enter the severest punishment. Here we have two situations. One of them is a current one, which is shown also by the temporal reference of morning and evening, and evening though they may not be uh, similar to our earthly ones, and the other situation would be at the day of the hour. In another verse, we learn about the state of the infidels killed in the battle of Badr against a prophet, where the angels were striking their faces and their backs. In the following Quranic verse, we have a depiction of the afterlife of a believer who was slain by his people. Where it was told to him, enter paradise, he said, I wish my people could know of how my Lord has forgiven me. Hence, this states that at the same moment he was talking, he wanted his people to know about his status in order to change their attitude. In other verses, we learn that the martyrs are alive and rejoicing in what God has given them. In other verses, we have description of the time of death in which the dying person's eyesight becomes sharper. In the chapter on Qaf, verses from 19 to 22, we have that description. The intoxication of death will bring the truth, and then we have removed from you your cover, so your sight this day is sharp. This may entail seeing other dimensions that were not accessible before. There is a barrier between the living and dead in the chapter of Al-Mu'minun. Death concepts in the hadith or sayings of Prophet Muhammad. In a saying of Prophet Muhammad, we learn that when a person dies and his companions return, he even hears their footsteps, and then two angels come to ask him some questions. In another saying, he said that he hears the sound of their sandals. In one occasion, Prophet Muhammad was talking to the infidels killed at the Battle of Badr, stating they hear quite clearly. This entails an active hearing faculty. In their graves, according to the Prophet, people are either tormented or rewarded, and he also said you will be tested in your graves. In a hadith, we are told that the dead person will have a wife and a family. So Prophet Muhammad offered the following funeral supplication. Give him in exchange a home better than his home, a family better than his family, or a mate better than his mate, because there are no single persons in paradise. 
Moreover, he said that the dead wait for the loved ones, and once they see a soul of a dead person approaching, they inquire about their relatives and their loved ones. Modern Scientific Experiments on Death I will refer to some brain experiments which possibly correspond to such Islamic concepts. Researchers at the University of Michigan conducted an experiment on nine rats at the moments of their death. Published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the researchers noted that after their heart ceased, the team measured a sharp increase in high-frequency brain waves or gamma oscillations. These pulses are believed to underpin consciousness in humans, and the pulses were even higher at the moments of their death. The second experiment by Nobu and his co-workers at the University of Washington. They observed that long dormant genes can be active for hours or days following the death of an organism, and they conducted their experiments on fish or mice. When Nobu and his team published their findings, Wiggle and his team were working on tissues from human donors, and the, the results did not come as surprising to them because they also found that genes become active from six hours post-mortem up to 24 hours. Other proofs from researchers on animals show that several genes are active up till 48 hours. Varied genes either dormant since birth or related to cancer woke up immediately after death. Another experiment was conducted by um, Jeffrey Loeb and his co-worker at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The brain does not stop as the heart ceases, and that's what they discovered. They took samples from patients in routine brain surgeries, and they noted that following simulated death, the glial cells increased their genetic activity till 12 hours or 24 hours without much change. Near-death experiences or NDEs We'll go back to the experiment of the Michigan team, the first experiment, where they noted that a surge of electrical activity in the brain could be responsible for experiences by near-death survivors. Another experiment was conducted by a team from New York Stony Brook University of Medicine. They investigated patients with cardiac arrests in Europe and the US. The team later noted that near-death survivors could remember the discussions between the healthcare staffs and were conscious of their environments. They remember going through a tunnel or a river toward the warm light and seeing their loved ones. However, the research can justify why they recall such happenings. Nevertheless, these results are still viewed with skepticism. If we compare between Islamic text and brain experiments, we will find that the activation of the optical areas in the brain is echoed in the Quranic verse, the chapter on Qaf. We have removed from you your cover, so your sight this day is sharp. Hence, the eyesight becomes sharper as iron at the moment of death, where it is mentioned in the, in the verse as iron. Moreover, the active hearing of the dead is stated in the hadith of Prophet Muhammad. Regarding Islamic text and NDEs, a number of NDE, uh, near-death survivors said they saw their loved ones, and in several NDEs, angels feature as guides. In both Quran and hadith, angels talk with the dead and once relatives come to see them. Dreams in Islamic tradition, dream is the main channel of communication between the dead and the living. It is a visualization that a person sees in his sleep. Considerable significance is given to true dreams in Islam. A true dream of a believer is one over 46 parts of prophethood. Therefore, faking a dream is alleging prophethood, and this would be tortured severely. In Islamic tradition, Prophet Muhammad classified dreams into Dreams from God or the angels, dreams from Satan, dreams from the self. A true vision is literal or symbolic. A vision may relate a past event or foretell a future event. Theories of dreams prior to Islamic tradition. They were theories of dreams at the early stages of the Mesopotamian civilization and also in the Greek civilization where we have two contrasting trends throughout the ancient epochs. One represented by Plato dream as a vision of the rational soul, the other by Aristotle as a problem of psychology. However, it is the late old heritage of the Greeks that had its direct impact on Islamic tradition. 
This is represented in Artemidorus of Daldis on dream interpretation. The pre-Islamic Arabs also had their peculiar interpretation of dreams as shown in their verses. Islamic tradition has areas of agreement with modern scientific psychologists in the last 150 years. For instance, the eminent dream interpreter Ibn Sirin's allusion to personality trait of the dreamer in the 8th century, which corresponds to modern psychology's decontextualization of dream and the dreamer. There is an equal interpretive rule in the 2nd century Artemidorus text translated into Arabic in the 9th century. At this stage, there was Islamizing of ancient Near Eastern, Biblical, Greek, and Asian theories of dreaming, alongside with concepts from the Quran and Hadith. So the interpreter should be knowledgeable of the Quran and Hadith of the Prophet, numerology, medicine, psychology, in addition to other disciplines. Psychology and Dreams in Modern Western Traditions Before Freud, dreams were thought to come from an exterior origin, as in, in the Greek tradition. To several of his contemporaries, dreams were meaningless products of the sleeping brain. However, a main shift was introduced with Freud the interpretation of dreams at the start of the 20th century. To Freud, a dream is the fulfillment of a wish which initiates from the unconscious, and the replacement of symbols in a dream with their stable hidden counterparts should be made by a psychoanalyst, which is totally different from the traditional interpretation of dreams. Young, a contemporary of Freud, related dreams to the unconscious. His interpretation of dreams is attained by a meticulous investigation of the context. Dream interpretation involves specified knowledge of mythology and folklore, in addition to the psychology of primitives and comparative religions. Nevertheless, later psychologists differed over the role and significance of dreaming. If we compare between Islamic dream concepts and Western ones, we will find that Freud and Young theories pertain to the third type of dreams in Islamic tradition, that of the self. However, Jung's theory is much more mature than that of Freud as it takes into account other social, religious, historical aspects in addition to the context. The soul. The soul from Islamic perspective. It is the soul that sees through visions. Conviction in the existence of the soul is present in the Abrahamic religions. In the Quran, God takes the souls of people in death or sleep. Hence, sleep is termed the minor death. Dreams as interactions of the dead and the living. We learn from the hadith of Prophet Muhammad that indeed a soul surely meets another soul in a dream, and the dead person may inform the living things about their position or those of others. His or her words are considered truthful, being in the truthful abode. However, the last issue is a contentious one. Regarding communications between dead and living companions, in Ibn al-Qaim's outstanding book Ar-Ruh, he relates several issues about the status of the soul, their encounters with other souls through dreams and similar, uh, similar topics. A prophetic rule is that the recurrency of dreams by several persons shows them to be true. So, different visions of martyrs show them leading a heavenly life, and in the Hadith, martyr spirits are in the giblets of green birds. Prophet Muhammad also said that he saw his cousin the martyr flying in paradise with the angels, and that the spirit of a believer is only a bird which feeds on the trees of paradise. He also explained that the souls of the dead people meet and get acquainted like birds meeting on top of trees. I will cite some of the historical dreams in Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned dreams that give glad tidings, warnings, advice, or similar other things, in addition to a pledges of friends, like the account of the pledge of Auf ibn Malik and his uh, friend Ibn Juzama, who promised each other that whoever dies first will tell the other what occurred to him. Auf saw his friend after a while in a dream telling him that he owes his Jewish neighbor 10 dinars and told him about its place in his home. Um, and he told him that he knows that their cat died and his little girl will die shortly, and that he knows about the appearances in their houses, and Auf found all these to be true. 
A companion of Prophet Muhammad died in a battle. His expensive shield was hit with one, by one of the Muslim soldiers. A man from the army dreamt of him telling him to find the shield and take it to the Prince of Believers to sell it on his behalf to pay his debts. The man found the shield in the very same place he was told about in the dream. There is also another dream that relates that the souls of friends meet every Friday and they receive news about their relatives. However, the hadith of the Prophet does not specify days or peoples, and up to now there are no scientific proofs to validate such true dreams. Personal Dreams Dreams of the researcher, her family, and acquaintances The researcher's brother, a police officer, died in action at the age of 32. A family member dreamt of him that he would bring the news of his death to his immigrant brother, who still didn't know about his death. He was wearing a white t-shirt and shorts. After a month, he went with the same word to his brother and told him, I am dead. A friend of the researcher dreamt at the day of his death that a person will die and as a martyr he will intercede for sanity of his family. Actually, the intercession of martyrs is stated in a saying of Prophet Muhammad. Dreams of the researcher's son she dreamed two similar dreams of her dead aunt and father in two consecutive days. They were comforting her and hugging her before her son's death, and she was crying earnestly. In, a, in another dream, her son warned her of a particular person, and a year later it turned out that he is a crook. A relative dreamt of the son. She told her that he said that he, he is near them. He made a drawing of his place, and the dreamer drew the figure to the researcher and told her that he was drawing mostly to repellent maps. However, the researcher thought that this is a similar drawing of Google Earth's image of their house. As you can see, Google Images to the right and to the left is the, the figure drawn by the dreamer, where we have at the top three arrows showing the three locations of the researcher on the left, her son in the middle, then the dreamer. He was possibly trying to tell them that he lives nearby, but in another dimension. My observations on dreams. The dead person may initially come frequently to their relatives in dreams, however, the, later they would come every once in a while. They are probably leading a parallel life and they become busy with their new relatives, wives, or husbands and friends in a different dimension. However, we have limited knowledge of the issue of the souls as God says in the Holy Quran, the soul is of the affair of my Lord and mankind have not been given of knowledge except a little. Dimensions and parallel worlds. I will give a very concise idea about the notions of dimensions and parallel worlds. In physics, the notion of parallel universes is imaginative, compelling, but very difficult to test. Multi-universes and parallel worlds are often discussed in the framework of the Big Bang theory, string theory, quantum mechanics. In the superstring theory, the universe exists in 10 different dimensions. Our universe has three, length, width, and depth, x, y, z. While the fourth dimension is time, the fifth and sixth dimensions are where the notion of possible world arises. In the seventh, access to the possible words that start with initial, different initial condition exists. The eighth gives us a plane of such possible universe histories. In the ninth, we can compare all possible universe histories. And in the tenth and final dimension, the point in which everything is possible and imaginable is covered. However, the M the uh, theory necessitates 11 dimensions and not 10. So, in which dimension do the dead people actually live? This is a very difficult question to answer because many physicists don't approve up till now of the idea of parallel worlds or even life in other planets. So, probably the dead live in a dimension where there is access to our past and future times or time, it is timelessness where they know all about our history and they can tell us some future events. And this has been represented in the Quranic verse cited at the beginning of the presentation on eyesight, where the cover is removed from the eyes, and now they have access to the absolute truth which was hidden from them um, previously. In the Holy Quran, there is mention of other creatures in other universes, so there are there is a possible life outside of the earth. 
God says and of his signs is the creation of heavens and earth and what he has dispersed throughout them of creatures and he for gathering them when he wills is competent. Conclusion In Islamic tradition, death is not the end of the human soul. The human soul persists in another form, that of a bird. The souls of dead people and the souls of the living can meet during sleep to send messages or ask for favors. The historical dreams in Islamic tradition and other personal dreams show such interactions. These visions, however, are not still regarded as true science. Dreams draw attention to paranormal occurrences and the notion of peril lives in other dimensions. These were witnessed by several peoples in their NDEs. Scientific studies reveal that those declared dead can hear and see and have awareness as in the Quran and Hadith, and these deserve more serious studies. Recommendations. Those in agony should keep themselves busy, immersed in physical or mental work. They can never forget their loved ones. However, this would lessen their agony and keep them in better hygiene. Thank you. Heba, thank you. You've given us a great deal to think about. And I love your final recommendations to us. Thank I, you I very think... much. It's very uh, nice of you. Thank you very much. I now have the task of, we've got about 15 minutes left now. And um, I wonder whether people would start to put any questions they might like into the Q&A. Uh, I'm just looking at the moment, there aren't any. So be the first to ask the question, as it says. But um, as we wait for other people to ask, ask the question. I just want to frame what we've just heard in the context of borrowed time, where we're really asking the question from three people, you three who have deep experience and highly creative and thoughtful and beautiful responses to living well until we die or and um, I wonder what that can teach us about living well and living sustainably in the context that we are talking about now in the context of, of our ecology. And for some, it may be more obvious than others, but I wonder whether each of you might make a reflection on that. What has your experience, what has your work taught you about living well and living sustainably at this particular moment in our in our history. I don't know whether someone would like to go first. I'm just thinking of it in terms of the life cycles that is referenced in in my work, Anna. So, um, in the same way that. When we look at how bee, bees have no awareness of anything outside, as far as we know, they have no awareness of anything outside what they need to do their work. Um, and in the same way, I suppose I feel um, thinking about Heba's um, presentation that we as human beings are very limited in, in what, in our understanding of our existence on the planet. And it's much, mm. my feeling on, on it is, is that it's much more limited than, than we realize. So in terms of um, sustainability of the planet, I suppose if, if, if we as human beings can realize that not only have we a limited understanding of our own existence on the planet, but our own existence in the entire universe and even in parallel universes, you know, that we actually are much, have much more, less control than, 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 than we give ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and that there are other dimensions. Um, and, and Margaret referenced that as well in terms of, of um, that beautiful poem, the, that, that, that the poet in residence came up with, you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, that there's a certain space there where we die. And then where you know people are left and people must go on and i suppose for me that's the essence is that when we pass through this world the planet will survive and will will exist in a different form 
for us, but it will move on depending on it. You know, when when in other words, when human beings pass through this world and move on, either either and as individuals or as a collective spe species, the Earth will survive. It's just how, in 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 some form. And it's our. It's I suppose I feel like it's our job to try and leave it in the best way possible. So in the same way as we try to live well, we try to die well, and we try to leave a legacy that 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 leaves something for other people. And, and that's the last question we ask in in the heart of living and dying is, what would you like your legacy to be? Yeah, yeah. You know, and often often people will say, well, I want to be known as a kind person. I want to be known as someone who's made a difference. That's great. Thank you, Gwen. A very excellent remark, actually. Can I jump in? You can, yeah, but <laughs> Well, uh, actually, speaking from my own knowledge, um, we do have really a very limited um, uh, knowledge, not, not only of um, the outside universe, but even of our universe. So um, the fact that we're here in the community of lovers of nature um, uh, pe many people don't realize that nature feels, that nature is full of life. Plants even feel uh, and mourn for the death of other plants. They do not, they, they are not inanimate. In Islam, we don't have this idea that these creatures are inanimate. On the contrary, they feel, they can decide, and they mourn, they, they, they love and they hate. Uh, for example, Prophet Muhammad said that he loves a mountain and this mountain loves him. And he even patted a tree trunk. And now we learn that from uh, botany um, and botanical experiments that um, plants actually feel. If you harm a plant, it will react. So when it sees you once more, it will uh, 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 emit vibrations that shows that it, uh, it is uh, really afraid of you. So. Um, we should try to be more um, um, you know, um, good at our um, relation with uh, nature itself, because um, nature has given us a lot, but we're not that good to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I suppose what I, I'm thinking about is um, how the drivers that are within ourselves and that drive society and that we try and check them in every day are the drivers for, for power, for, for honour and for money. And, and ultimately, if we need to need and, and have to live sustainably, then it's, I suppose, each we can only begin with ourselves, that the more daily that we check ourselves in and think, well, actually, life is so short. And as Gwen, again, so beautifully shared about walking the dog, about being by the beach, about doing what you love in nature and being more drawn to that side of our nature than the other, then that will build up um, a better life within our homes, within our communities, within our worlds. And so it starts with, with ourselves living sustainably and choosing the good rather than the, the other side of um, our ego that, that we all have. Thank you, Maggie. Now, I haven't got any questions yet coming up, except for one about whether we can, you are prepared to share your slides, Hiba, particularly with the references uh, in course. your slideshow. Of course. So the answer to that, June, is yes. Yes, um, of course. And Rachel, I have a question from Rachel, which is, hi all, thanks for great presentations. Heba, are there references in the Islamic tradition to visitations of the dead to those imminently dying that Margaret mentioned, other than in dreams? Well, actually, um, I'm not aware of that. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, um, very obvious text about this, but we do know that they know about the occurrences that that happen in our houses and they can see us, they know all about us. And if this is so, they may have um, uh, access to our houses or common visitations. But uh, from the Islamic point of view, um, I'm not sure that there's anything else uh, except of the text that I cited. 
at least uh, for now. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And then I have a comment, um, a comment from Richard. As we were talking about this morning, as someone with a flaring disease that occasionally brings me feeling near to death, one of the ways of not letting that disease become me, I perhaps, perhaps I focus on living well and supporting others. So I think that relates very much to Haber's, what you were saying to us at the end, to, yes. uh, yeah. To and then I have another comment here from Rosie. Maybe we can draw hope from this as we face mass extinction that somehow some part of us in this interconnected world lives on the true self question mark thank you rosie uh hang on i'm just looking down uh things are still coming in yes uh june asks whether heba sees the possibility of acceptance of spiritual truths of various kinds as of, as having a validity again in Western cultures, as she has in her culture. Pardon, um, I don't think I I get that quite clearly. So she's saying, what is the spiritual truth for Heber, and can it be various? Is June's first question, but then the second part of the question is, I ask whether Heber sees the possibility of acceptance of spiritual truths as having a validity again in Western cultures, as she has in her culture? Well, I know um, this question should be asked to uh, Western, the Western world, because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do believe that after all of these experiments show that there's really a life after death, or at least partly for some time, maybe someone can, could change their attitude, but I'm not sure, of course. I might we, put that, I think you're right. I might put that question to Maggie. I mean, Maggie, what's your view on, on that? There's a kind of assumption behind the question, I think. It's it's a really good question, and um, I'm just mulling actually that uh, it's it's that sense of um, I I suppose our interconnectedness in in nature, and the sense of um, that uh, that there is a sense of uh, a higher created being. Uh, for some, we see that in the context of a god, uh, and for me, I see it in the context of God. But but it's. Um, that the more we're, we're drawn to that higher created being, I'd say that the more things fall into their natural order because we know that the that um, to live sustainably, we need to live with that natural order. Um, and so in terms of what we can learn from, uh, from Heber and what we can learn from Islamic tradition um, is I, I think that there is a great beauty uh, and, and a great sense of, of truth and a great sense of interconnectedness and a, a great sense that, the, that, that there is something else there. And um, as I'm just looking in terms of the Q&A, uh, it, it was Carrie that said, uh, that is the um, as our in, as the world lives on that it's perhaps our true self. Um, that I think that's very beautiful as well. I don't think it's fully answered the question, Anna, because I think it's a hard question to um, to answer. You probably need a whole thesis on it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> if any of our PhD students want to uh, cover that one, then uh, very happy to to have a chat with them. No, I, I, I agree. It's not going to be answered, certainly in the next four minutes. So I wonder whether there are any more, um, any other comments? Um, Excuse me, regarding the other question, that of spirituality, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I got that right, or I, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand it well. So um, could you well, please... Well, June, do you want to clarify what I have is, what is spiritual truth for Heba? And can it be various? Oh, uh, um, you mean, um, can we accept other spiritual frameworks than, uh, than ours? Is that it? 
Um, I don't want to put words into her mouth, but I think I think that uh, that that's yes. Well, let's try answering that one. Well, uh, let me be um, a bit more down to earth and tell you that um, in, in in the Islamic tradition, people are not to judge others. And even God said, those who will judge others and tell them that you will go to heaven, they will not go to heaven. On the contrary, God may make the others go to heaven while he who makes of himself a God to judge and to compel others will not be accepted. Mm -hmm. This is for one. This is what I can say about this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need to draw to a close now because uh, we're coming to the end. But I want to say thank you to all of you. That's been thank a you. really thought provoking um, session. And I kind of agree that I want to actually close with um, I, I very much like what Rosie put to us, which Maggie drew attention to, which is that um, the hope perhaps that we can draw from this as we face yes. what's happening to us is that some part of us in this interconnected world lives on and that's the true self. So thank you, Rosie, uh, for that. And thank you, everybody, for being with us. Thank you um, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nice being with you. And you. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. bye. bye.